Good morning, Internet, and welcome to this segment of What the Hell is Going On? Starring myself, Bryce Barnett, and we have David here who studies history and international politics. So David was telling me a little bit ago about what was happening between Armenia and Azerbaijan. I probably said that wrong, but David will, will say it correctly shortly. I want to know what what the hell is going on with that. So, David, can you can you share some light on that? So, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover what the hell happened, completely unbiased, and then we're going to share our thoughts on it at the end. So, David, go ahead and take it away. What what the hell is going on? Thank you for inviting me to the podcast. My pleasure. So during the period of America's 2020 election between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, Azerbaijan invaded its neighbor Armenia over the region of Artsakh, which is actually a very common tactic used by countries in order to mask their military operations as most Western media will be covering the American election. In order to understand what went down, we need to jump into some context and history on the liberation struggle of Artsakh to explain the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Armenia and Azerbaijan are both ex-Soviet republics in a region called the Caucasus, which is an extremely diverse area linguistically, ethnically, and religiously. We here is a geographic map of the Caucasus. It's basically a region that's squeezed between Russia, Turkey, and Iran in the south. Is this the Middle East? Is this considered the Middle East? Some people may consider it as part of the Middle East. It's generally been classified as part of West Asia. There's a common term that's actually used in reference to the Caucasus. It's known as Swana, and mm -hmm. that refers to Southwest Asia and North Africa. So it's basically the Middle East, the Caucasus, and North Africa. They're normally piled together because of very similar cultural and historical attributes. But besides that, the Caucasus is not directly part of the Middle East. Okay. However, many Armenians do inhabit extensively across many Middle Eastern countries, such as Iran, Syria, and particularly Lebanon. So there is quite a history there. So and so I'm from, I, David, I'm from America, and I don't know anything. I, I, you know, I wrote, I was born understanding that America was the only thing that mattered. Got so it. like what, so what is, what is Armenia? And then, and then what is, what is Azerbaijan? Yeah, so both Armenia and Azerbaijan are both ex-Soviet republics. So what that okay. means is that from the period of the early 1920s to 1991, there was a united government called the USSR or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And Armenia and Azerbaijan were both part of this large country. And each republic was administrated basically very autonomously. They're kind of akin to states in the United States. So it, it's, it's okay. very, very similar. I, I know what those are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know what that is. <laughs> Armenia is part is particularly a very ancient country. It goes back nearly 3000 years. You know, really? There, yeah, we've actually got very similar history along with ancient Assyria, with the ancient Persians. Uh, we've even got some words that are secondhand loaned from Sumerians. So it, it is a particularly ancient country. Armenia is also very historically famous as it's also the first nation to have adopted Christianity. Actually, really? To have adopted Christianity in when? 301 when? AD. Yeah, in 301 AD. 301. So before that, there were no Christians? Uh, no Christian nation. A Christian so, nation. So, yeah. So as we all know, Christ, he was killed in the early to mid first century AD. Before that, there were very isolated communities of Christians. Of course, they're very popular you know, across the Middle East and across the Mediterranean in Anatolia, but no country had officially adopted it as their state religion until Armenia did in 301 AD. So actually the oldest cathedral, the oldest national cathedral is actually located in Armenia. It's known as Etchmiatzin. So this is the Etchmiatzin Cathedral. It mm -hmm. is the oldest cathedral in human history. Azerbaijan, on the other hand, it is a uh, Turkic-speaking country. So they share a very similar language as with Turkey. Their roots are associated with the Turkish migration, which happened across Eurasia between the 6th and the 11th century, 
where Turks from Central Asia moved across into the Middle East and Europe. And Azerbaijan as a Turkic nation is partially descended from these people as well as the Turkified in indigenous inhabitants of the region. So that's Azerbaijan. Yep. Okay. So so it sounds like that they're both uh, peaceful countries and, and they have no problems. Yeah, definitely that is not the case. Uh, oh. There's been uh, quite of several centuries worth of conflict, but today we're going to particularly focus on the region of Karabakh, or as it's known in Armenian as Artsakh, which is this region over here in Azerbaijan. Now, to really understand the struggle of Artsakh a little bit better, we got to jump a couple decades in the past. So both the present borders of Armenia and Azerbaijan were part of the Russian Tsarist Empire uh, beginning in the early to mid 1800s. Now, already around this time, there was quite a lot of tension between the Armenians and the Turkic speaking Azerbaijanis, which by 1905 had culminated into a series of very bloody battles and outbreaks of violence uh, known as the Armenian Tatar massacres of 1905 to 1907. Uh, they were known as Tatars back then, and they were particularly influenced by nationalistic rhetoric from the Turkish Ottoman Empire. However, things really did change at the outbreak of World War I, which one, the Turkish Ottoman Empire used as an excuse to eliminate its Armenian population, resulting in the death or deportation of up to one and a half million Armenians, known as the Armenian Genocide, which is now extensively denied by both Turkey and Azerbaijan. So, so wait, with, they're, so they're, they're saying it just didn't happen? Yeah, well, there's quite a lot of uh, things that they say. One group of Turks might say it didn't happen at all. Uh, another group of Turks might say, um, yeah, it did happen, but you know they were justified in, in killing uh, Armenians. And another side might say, Yes, it did happen, and I hope it happens again. Uh, so there's, uh, so they're, so they're like super Hitler, like, uh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, actually, funny that you mention it. Uh, Hitler, in first coming up with the Holocaust, which we all know killed up to six million Jews and many other million minorities, actually got inspiration from the Armenian genocide. He's oh, like, yep, yeah. He so it's literally this is what caused Hitler to happen. More in, or less. In some, in some regard, there is some influence. He's, he's actually quoted on saying on who now remembers the Armenians. So he's, he's basically wow. saying, uh, yeah, he, he, he basically tried to justify the Holocaust by saying, oh, yeah, in a couple of decades, no one will remember the, the Jews, uh, which, which obviously, thankfully, we do remember the victims of the Holocaust. He mentioned the Armenian genocide because by then no one really talked about the Armenian genocide. It sort of inspired him to also do the Holocaust. Holy crap. So what was their problem with them in the first place? So uh, you mentioned that there were wars and battles, and but like what, what was, why, why was that happening? So the, if, if we go in too much detail, we might go on a you know, com total tangent uh, just because the, uh, uh, the reasons of the Armenian genocide is very, very deep. First uh -huh. thing, obviously, would be the rising tide of nationalism. At this period, the Ottoman Empire was sort of falling apart, mostly mm -hmm. because different groups of people were developing the idea of their own nation state. This particularly began in the Balkans, you know, Serbian nationalism, uh, Bulgarian nationalism, Greek nationalism. But eventually, as a reactionary force, the Turkic speaking peoples of the Ottoman Empire developed their own nationalism known as Turkish nationalism. And this inspired them to want to have a homogenous Turkish republic in Anatolia. And unfortunately for them, Anatolia was not homogenous. And by homogenous, I mean, was not the single ethnicity, right? All of Anatolia was an extremely diverse area of not only Turks, um, but of course of Armenians, of Kurds, of Arabs in some parts. And it was part of the plan for Turkish nationalists to also remove all of the indigenous inhabitants of those areas to take their property, to steal their wealth in order to really develop the new Turkish economy, which was a new invention at the time. Got, okay, so there are a lot of reasons. A lot of reasons, very complicated okay. reasons. And that's okay. just the tip of the iceberg. 
And the second major event that happened at the outbreak of World War I was the workers' revolts that eventually became the Bolshevik Revolution to overthrow the Tsar in 1917, which was happening in Russia. Now, at this period of instability, in April of 1918, the caucus declared independence from the Russian Tsarist Empire, and this was known as the Transcaucasian Democratic Federative Republic which roughly corresponded to the borders of Armenia, of Azerbaijan, and of Georgia, which is another republic in the Caucasus. But this country quickly fell apart only a month later when all three of these countries declared independence from each other, resulting in the First Republic of Armenia, the First Republic of Azerbaijan, and the First Republic of Georgia, which all declared independence of May in 1918. So as you can see, the Federation was proclaimed on April 22, 1918. Georgia declared independence just a month later, and Armenia and Azerbaijan declared independence just a couple days after that. And they were succeeded by three different countries over here, all independent of this larger country. Now, as I said previously, the Caucasus is a very, very diverse area. So if we actually get out a map of the Caucasus, now I, I do want to say this is the map of the caucus right now. It was kind of different 100 years ago, but it just goes to show just how many different languages, how many different ethnicities, how many different religions exist in just this little small area. So when all three of these countries declared independence from each other, these very newly formed countries quickly fell into war with each other due to the lack of clarity between these borders, because one area might have a major ethnicity of, uh, of one group with a big percentage of minorities, or there might be an area with no majority of any group at all. So the borders were very inconsistent with this. So they all fell into quite several months of war with each other and due to the lack of clarity. Now, one of these regions was the region of Karabakh. So as you can see, this is the First Republic of Armenia. Most of the territory is disputed, right? So this blue disputed with Georgia over here was disputed with Azerbaijan. So, you know, the, the borders were not clear at all. So one of the disputed areas between the First Republic of Armenia and the First Republic of Azerbaijan was Karabakh, which roughly corresponds to this region right now. It's a very mountainous region. Karabakh is the Azerbaijani word for it. It comes from, it, it basically means black garden with uh, Kara meaning black in Turkic and Bagh meaning garden in Persian. In Armenian, it's known as Artsakh, which is one of the historical provinces of Armenia. Now, in this period of 1918, Karabakh has a population that was 71.4% Armenian and 25.5% Azerbaijani. Now, as these two new countries, right, the new Republic of Armenia and the new Republic of Azerbaijan are fighting over this disputed area, as you can see over here, see it's, 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 it's mostly disputed. Ottoman Empire invades the Caucasus and along with the Azerbaijani militias who are supporters of the Ottoman Empire, they murdered nearly 10 to 30,000 Armenians in Baku, which is the capital city of Azerbaijan. And two years later, in March of 1920, the Azerbaijani army murders up to 20,000 Armenians in Shushi, which is the cultural capital of Karabakh, completely burning down the Armenian district of the city and dropping the Armenian population uh, roughly from 55% prior to the war to just 1.8% in 1920. And this is known as the Shushi massacre. In Azerbaijani, the name of the city is named Shusha, but in Armenian, it's Sushi. So mm. this was the Sushi massacre of 1920. The entire Armenian district was burned and up to 20,000 Armenians uh, were killed. Let's say 500 now, up to 20,000 and they're not sure? Yeah, the Azerbaijani side, they mostly reject these allegations and they would say either no one died or they would say, yeah, only 500 died. Or they would say, yeah, a bunch of them died, but, you know, they deserved it. Whatever the case. Yeah, so it's it's somewhere in the range of, of 500 to 20,000. Yeah. You know, it's like, who knows? Yeah. The hell. So these, these allegations, as I said, they're completely denied um, by Azerbaijan. Or they condensed their reasoning to, you know, oh, Armenians did this. So we had no choice but to slaughter them. And they brought it upon themselves, which is just of course, part of the dehumanization process of Armenophobia. 
Now, the next month, in April of 1920, the newly established Soviet Union, which resulted from the Bolshevik Revolution I mentioned earlier, invaded Azerbaijan. And in November, they beat back the Turkish armies and they took Armenia. And in March of 1921, uh, they took Georgia. So they ended the short period of very violent independence for all three Caucasus countries. Now, unfortunately, though, this also marks the beginning of the solidification of Azerbaijani control over Artsakh. However, it didn't really need to be that way. Seeing the Armenian majority on July 3rd, 1920, the Caucasus Bureau of the Soviet Union actually endorsed the idea of Artsakh, which is uh, the Armenian word for Karabakh here. And they endorsed the idea of Artsakh to be under Armenia. However, only two days later, this was reversed by Joseph Stalin for reasons yet currently unclear. Despite this, a few months later in November, uh, the Azerbaijani Soviet Socialist Republic also formally recognized Karabakh as part of Armenia, but this was once again denied. So in 1923, Karabakh was formally given to Azerbaijan. It was declared an autonomous status under Azerbaijan. It was known as the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast, also known as the NKAO. In 1926, it was reported that it had a population that was 89.2% Armenian and just 10% Azerbaijani. Now, though this period of Sovietization in Karabakh had relatively high rates of growth, high rates of peace and stability, at least compared to the brutality just a couple decades earlier, Armenians still faced relatively high rates of discrimination. For example, many Armenian churches were shut down or not allowed to operate under the guise of state atheism, which was the proclaimed religion of the Soviet Union. Yet many mosques were actually allowed to still operate. Armenian language schools were heavily restricted. And for this reason, many Armenians in Karabakh were actually forced to learn Russian as a first language rather than their native language of Armenian. And as early as the 1960s, there were already many peaceful demonstrations and petitions to have the NKAO unify with the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic. But this movement really, really took off in the 1980s, where thousands of people both in the NKAO and Armenia took part in protests, took part in hunger strikes and sit-ins, and much more, with many Azerbaijani counter-protests, which ended up as violent clashes. In February of 1988, the NKAO Supreme Council issued a request to the Soviet Socialist Republic for official transfer to Armenia. However, this was rejected. At this point, the violence really started to pick up. For example, that month in Sumgait, Azerbaijan's third largest city, Police officers, politicians, and even just regular civilians organized in the violent program against the Armenian inhabitants, where roads in and out of the Armenian district were closed off, addresses of Armenians were distributed, and three days of violence, including looting, sexual assault, arson, robbing, and murder occurred, resulting in up to 20,000 Armenians leaving the city to Armenia. Over 100,000 Armenians protested this in Yerevan the next month, which is the capital of Armenia. Just the next couple of months in November of that year, a similar event occurred in Janza, Azerbaijan's second largest city, where up to 100,000 Armenians had to be evacuated. And in January of 1990, yet again, a very similar violent event happened in Baku, where over 100,000 Armenians had to leave the city due to violence against them. At this period, the NKAO is 76.9% Armenian. So this entire time, it had always held a very large Armenian majority. In November of 1991, the autonomous status of the NKAO was revoked by Azerbaijan, and in December, 99.98% of the Armenians in Karabakh voted to be independent, uh, which is rejected by Azerbaijan. And just two weeks after that, the Soviet Union is officially dissolved, and Armenia and Azerbaijan are once again independent countries. Now, tired of these decades of peaceful protests, decades of democratic referendums, extreme violence, and just being worried that a similar event, such as events that happened in Sumgayat, Ganja, and Baku would occur in Karabakh. In 1992, 
Armenia officially invaded Azerbaijan and liberated Artsakh in a war that lasted until 1994. So as you can see, the region of Karabakh, the NKAO, was liberated along with some regions around it. And this breakaway region was, is, is known as Artsakh. So again, a lot of news media will just portray Armenia as, you know, the second Azerbaijan became independent in 1991, then the next year, Armenia just randomly decided to invade them. This is obviously very untrue because it's taking away the entire context of decades of peaceful protests, decades of uh, demonstrations, of democratic referendums, and decades of violence that had kicked out, you know, hundreds of thousands of Armenians from Azerbaijan, and just this fear that this would be happening once again in Karabakh are some of the main motives that caused Armenia to later invade Azerbaijan in 1992. So this war then ended in 1994. And for decades, for up to 30 years, basically, not much happens, right? You know, every couple of years, there's some border clashes, but more or less, it stays like this for a couple of decades, mostly because Armenia likes the status quo, right? Because they have Karabakh, there's not much that they want to change, they've liberated the region, and Azerbaijan is just not in a position to really fight back until September of 2020. So within 44 days, along with support from Turkey and support from Israel, Azerbaijan takes over approximately half of the former NKAO, including the cultural capital of Shushi, which just almost exactly 100 years ago in 1920, they had killed up to 20,000 Armenians in the city. And the Azerbaijani army used extensive barbaric methods of warfare, such as burning over 40,000 acres of forests with phosphorus gas, uh, using internationally banned weapons. They also imported terrorists from Syria to fight, which has been confirmed by Iran. And they've done many other of these sorts of war crimes. For example, they have beheaded on camera the last Armenian resident of Hadrut, which is this uh, city in the south over here. Almost the entire Armenian population had to be evacuated. This one, like old grandpa, decided to stay and he was beheaded on camera for this act of resistance. And since the end of the war, which ended at the end of 2020, Russian peacekeeping forces have been deployed in the area, but the crimes have unfortunately not stopped. So the Azerbaijani military has committed 56 crimes against Artsakh Armenians since the peace, with 43 criminal cases opened, including three murders, 23 attempted murders, and one act of terrorism. Many Armenian churches and cemeteries have been fully or partially destroyed, such as the Armenian Ghazan Chetsov Cathedral, which was partially blown up by a missile. There's actually a huge hole in the wall, as you can see in this image over here. This is the interior after the missile was shot into the church. And the cathedral, which is located in Shushi, is now under Azerbaijani renovations. Of course, this isn't new, as Azerbaijan has been doing these sorts of cultural damages to many Armenian cemeteries and churches located across Azerbaijan for decades, such as the Armenian Cemetery of Jura which is located near the city of Julfa. And this was actually the largest Armenian cemetery that had existed. And it has been confirmed that ever since the late 1990s, the government of Azerbaijan began a systematic campaign to destroy all of the monuments. And these monuments include Khachkars, basically an Armenian sort of cross stone. That's the exact definition. Khach means cross in Armenian and kar means stone. So it's literally cross stones. And Armenians use these as a marker for a grave. So Azerbaijan has been systematically destroying these in the Armenian cemetery of Jura near the city of Julfa uh, since the late 1990s. So these damages to Armenian historical artifacts and churches and cemeteries has been quite institutional for quite a period. And this is part of a systematic attempt to deny Armenians its indigenous historical presence in the region of Azerbaijan. And since then, many border towns across Armenia have been shot at by the Azerbaijani military since the peace treaty. Border towns and roads have been occupied or blocked off by Azerbaijan, resulting in basically a blockade of Armenian towns within Azerbaijan, particularly the town of Kapan. And it's actually quite possible that Azerbaijan had hopes of even invading the Armenian province of Sunik, which is this uh, southern region over here, to connect it to one of its exclaves known as Nakhichevan. So Azerbaijan has this exclave that's not connected to the rest of its country. It's called 
Nakhchivan. It's basically two parts of Azerbaijan that's separated by Armenia. So there might have been some hopes of Azerbaijan to invade Sunik, which is this region over here, to connect it to Nakhchivan. However, thankfully, this plan might have been thwarted as Iran intervened to defend Armenia's political integrity in October of 2021. Just in the first half of November, the Azerbaijani occupation also shot and killed a 22-year-old Armenian worker who was fixing pipes around Shushi due to a drought that had been more or less manufactured by Azerbaijan. So this is just the political situation of today. Uh, it's consistently changing. As you can tell, some of these dates are quite recent towards the end of 2021. So that's a summary of what's been going on. So David, is this whole event bad or good or is it somewhere in between? Well, obviously, this is obviously a very bad thing. This is really bad. Especially for the indigenous inhabitants of Artsakh. I guess what's very important to take away from here is that a liberation struggle is never going to be delivered with only peaceful methods, particularly if your oppressor is hell-bent on the complete elimination of your people. So we should really always remember the struggle of the Artsakh Armenians uh, both past and and current, on the terrible uh, nature of occupation, of ethnic cleansing, and of Armenian phobia. Do you think this is not getting as much news as it should? Yeah, definitely. It's it's very seldom covered in the, in Western media in general. And when they do, it's honestly such such a terrible way of wording the the conflict. Uh, which is actually something that they say. They say it's a conflict, which is a term I highly disagree with because conflict would imply that there's like two equal sides that are just having a conflict over a region. But this isn't a conflict. This is a liberation struggle, right? It's the people of Artsakh who are being oppressed uh, by the oppressive Azerbaijani government. So it's not as much a conflict as it, as it is just a struggle for liberation, a struggle uh, for freedom, and a struggle for, uh, for self-determination. So I've had some viewers that are from Azerbaijan that were celebrating that these events happen. Is this a good mindset to have? Or, or like, what, what would you say to viewers that might be on, that are involved in the situation, but are uneducated on the situation. Yeah, in in the term in in, in terms of Azerbaijanis, the current Azerbaijan government, uh, led by Aliyev, is a very reactionary, fascistic uh, sort of authoritarian government. Um, just as of late 2021, there has been um, the. Um, several cases of the Azerbaijani government having tortured Azerbaijanis have, uh, have recently arisen, known as the Tertur cases. Uh, so this is definitely a government that's filled with propaganda, uh, filled with uh, extremely ultra-nationalistic rhetoric, uh, filled with very reactionary sort of, you know, fas fascism that's uh, uh, quite popular around, uh, around the country with many fascistic uh, paramilitaries being uh, being a very um, commonly be, be, being very commonly celebrated across both Turkey and Azerbaijan, for example, uh, the Grey Wolves, which is a very fa very fascist uh, sort of movement. That even though in I believe in Azerbaijan the party is technically banned, it's very widely celebrated across you know you know across different cities with with a lot of people. Um, celebrating some of their terroristic um, actions, and it's it's uh, it's just it's a very propaganda-filled country. Right over here, I have an article on the Turtur case, where eleven deaths in in custody and other serious human rights were being violated by the fascist state of Azerbaijan. And these are you know Azerbaijani civilians, right? They've been detained. At least seventy-eight Armenian civilians detained with multiple cases of torture including 11 deaths uh, in custody of the Azerbaijani military personnel and civilians. 
And this was mostly because they were without evidence said to be spies of Armenia, which is just a false accusation. It's just a very fascist crackdown on its own people. And several protests across the recent history of Azerbaijan have been severely cracked down upon by the Azerbaijani police and military. So Azerbaijani celebrating the conquest of Artsakh is, is something that's very expected given the propaganda, given the fascist nature of the government of Azerbaijan, and just given the ultra-nationalistic indoctrination that's quite common across Azerbaijan and Turkey. So this is what the map of Armenia and Azerbaijan looked like from 1994 all the way to 2020. So this light green color, which is uh, internationally recognized as being part of Azerbaijan, is actually the Armenian invasion that happened to liberate Artsakh from Azerbaijan. So as you can see, this shaded over here, this was the NKAO and this light green color that's around it. These were areas that were not part of the NKAO, but that were invaded by Armenia in order to reach uh, the NKAO. And this is how it looked like for, uh, for almost 20 years until 2020. And now this is how the map looks like now. So as you can see, this dotted line over here, this was the previous map, right? So, so that's uh, this border over here. So this was the previous border of the Republic of Artsakh. And this light blue color over here, this is what they in officially invaded, right? From September of 2020 all the way to November of 2020. So they took some segments here in the north. They took about half of the former NKAO. What this dark green color represents is what then Armenia gave as part of the peace consensus. So this part, which was uh, not part of the NKAO previously, which was which was always part of Azerbaijan, but that Armenia invaded starting in uh, 1992 all the way to 1994. So this was given in the peace treaty that was uh, signed in November of 2020. And this orange color is right now what's left of Artsakh. So this region, it's currently de facto independent. But as you can see, about half of it over here is being occupied. This line over here is, is what the previous border was. And then these dark green colors were all given to Azerbaijan. This dark red over here, this is Armenia. Uh, this dark red over here, this is the former NKAO. And the blue over here, this is Azerbaijan. And then this light red over here, were parts of Azerbaijan that were occupied by Armenia following uh, the 1992 war. So as, as September goes ahead, they start invading parts of the north and they start taking parts of the south over here. So a ceasefire is signed um, in, uh, in November, where they've already taken about half of the former NKO. But then these other segments over here, this was given as part of the treaty. So right now the map looks like this. So uh, this uh, the, the dark blue was given, the light blue is occupied by Azerbaijan, and you've got what remains of the, of the Republic of Artsakh being this uh, red over here, when it had previously uh, looked something like this. So is there anything that you hope can be done at this point? The truth is, is that the national policy of Azerbaijan is to not only eliminate all ethnic Armenians from its border, but also eliminate all historical presence of Armenian churches, of Armenian cemeteries, of any Armenian buildings or any historical presence of Armenians having been living in the territories of Azerbaijan. So I cannot possibly see a political situation with Azerbaijan. The only political situation for Artsakh would have to be formed by and only with the people of Artsakh. So you're saying Azerbaijan is literally just destroying Armenian history from that territory. Yep, and, and they have for many decades. They have uh, destroyed the Armenian cemetery of Jura, which is located near, near Jolfa in Nakhichevan. Uh, they um, 
often have eliminated a lot of Armenian churches that are also located across uh, other parts of Azerbaijan, including cemeteries have actually recently been discovered to have been completely destroyed by Azerbaijan. Here's one from actually August 22nd, 2021, where it, it shows satellite imagery that reveals Azerbaijan's erasure of Armenian sites. Using high-resolution satellite imagery, the Caucasus Heritage Watch has identified over a dozen Armenian sites that have been destroyed, damaged, or threatened. Here's one. So here's a cemetery that existed over here. This is June 21st, 2020. So this is before the war. And this is April 9th, 2021. So this is after the war. So as you can see, a lot of these, what I assume are headstones, right, because it's a cemetery. So these are um, probably Khachkars, uh, which are Armenian headstones, which have been completely flattened in, uh, in an Armenian cemetery. This is the cathedral that's located in Shushi, which has been destroyed. And as, as you can see, part of it has been renovated. Uh, we're not sure to what extent they mean by renovation, but there's some evidence of damages. Here are some other, uh, so here's another cemetery. So you could see some headstones over here, which have been flattened completely. And from Azerbaijan's perspective, is this necessary to destroy Armenian history? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's completely necessary to destroy Armenian uh, history so that no Armenian can then claim that it's historic Armenian territory. So it's sort of like cleansing the history or rewriting the history of regions within their own country to make it look like that they have always been the ones who have occupied this land, even though Armenians have far persisted in, in these lands for centuries prior to any Azerbaijani settlements. What do you think can be done to stop any more from happening than it needs to? It's sort of a complicated question because it's not, uh, it's not a simple solution. I think, number one, first phase would, ha would have to be just from the people, right? The, there, there would have to be such large-scale civil disobedience, civil resistance from the people of, Ar of Artsakh to defend their lands. Is there any evidence of retaliation from the people of that area? Uh, actually, in the early November of 2021, an Armenian civilian who had been working on just some pipes around Shushi was shot and killed by Azerbaijani forces. And the soldiers who had killed him have yet to be detained, have yet to see any consequences. And as a result, so in mid-November, in retaliation, uh, this Armenian civilian's brother had thrown a grenade at a checkpoint, at an, at an Azerbaijani checkpoint. No Azerbaijani soldiers were killed, but he was detained by the Russian peacekeeping forces, which sort of is hypocritical because the Azerbaijani soldiers who had killed his brother have not been detained by the Russian peacekeeping forces. However, in retaliation, his brother, who had threw a grenade at these forces at a checkpoint, has been detained by the Russian peacekeeping forces. So this is one of the only sort of retaliations I've seen so far, but we've yet to see this struggle fully unfold. What do you hope will happen from this point forward? Well, what I would hope is that more countries would show solidarity with the struggle in Artsakh and hopefully the government of Armenia and the people of Artsakh can uh, muster the necessary uh, inspiration and the necessary bravery in order to fight back this occupation. Do you think the United States should or would or even cares about this? Um, well, it's quite obvious that the United States cares about this as the United States actively funds both the Turkish military and the Azerbaijani military. And the U.S. is also famous for giving a lot of aid to Israel, who also funds the Azerbaijani military. So I think it's quite clear to me that America, though pretending to be neutral in official statements, has quite clearly picked a side, and that side would be for the fascist occupation, the Turkish side. Wow. So in other words, the United States is against preserving Armenian history. Yes. So it's quite obvious that as the United States endorses the idea that Karbakh should be under Azerbaijani law, and under Azerbaijani law, they have completely destroyed a lot of Armenian historical buildings and sites there. And that by proxy, the United States quite actively supports 
the genocidal actions conducted by Azerbaijan. Wow. So what can we do here in the States about this? What can we do in the States? Well, first and foremost, I would recommend just learning. Information is very important and learning more about these conflicts, it's going to give you an edge in really understanding what's going on and preserving the self-determination of the indigenous people in the region. Number two, I would be boycotting Turkish products. I would be boycotting Azerbaijani products. I would be boycotting NATO and other sorts of American instruments for imperialism. And NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is an organization of most of Europe, as well as the United States and Canada, where they have a military alliance basically saying that they would support each other in the case of military defense. And NATO actively funds Turkey. And by proxy, Turkey is actively funding Azerbaijan, which is this country right here. Azerbaijan is not part of NATO, but Azerbaijan is a very, very close country with Turkey. In fact, the leader of Azerbaijan has said that Turkey and Azerbaijan are basically one people, two countries. So that's how close that they see each other. They're, they, they see each other as practically the same people just in two countries. So Turkey actively funds Azerbaijan and Turkey is an extension of NATO. So really this is once again an extension of American imperialism that by proxy has funded Azerbaijan in their genocidal war against Armenians. Wow. How do you feel about this? Well, just another reason to be against American imperialism. The act of a country pushing their own agenda, usually through violence, onto another country. And this could be through economic imperialism. This could be military imperialism. There are quite a number of different imperialisms, but America has a very imperialistic history. So what are your final thoughts if you were to give a message to the people that are watching what should be taken away from all of this? The main real takeaway here is that we need to put an end to the American military industrial complex. Because though the actors of this war have been Azerbaijan, um, have indirectly been Turkey and Israel and, and the United States and other such NATO countries, that At the end of the day, these are all extensions of Western interests, both directly and indirectly. In order to put an end to conflicts here in Armenia, but not only in Armenia, but worldwide, we would need to really put an end to the American military industrial complex. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. Because now I know what the hell is going on. Yeah. I had no idea. I was so I was so confused. So what's your number one uh, takeaway here? What's the most important thing you think you've learned? My takeaway is as much as you try to erase history, especially in today's age with the internet, the fact that this video exists, the the fact that there's other documentation, there's, there's no way you're going to erase history in, in, in today's technology age. And so it is a crime against humanity to have just any country or anyone deciding to erase history of any kind. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. What are your guys' thoughts? I want you guys to go ahead and let us know in the comments and We'll be quick to respond. We'll probably have David respond because he definitely knows a lot more than I do about this topic. And that'll be a good thing. If there's other topics you guys want us to touch on, then go ahead and write those in too. And then we'll explain to you what the hell is going on. I appreciate your time being here, David. Is there a reason you're not on camera? I probably should not have done that. You had to eat right now. I forgot. In, In the closing of our video. All right. So thank you, David. I appreciate you being here and explaining that to us because I, I had no idea. And yeah, of course. It, it was it was a pleasure to uh, to be here. I definitely think that a lot of people were able to take away a lot from this. So I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you guys so much for watching. So I want you guys to go ahead and click in the top right corner for the next episode. And you can click in the top left corner for another 
video as well. But that being said, thank you guys so much for watching. I love you very much. And until next time, later days. All right. See you guys.